This video presentation and its accompanying materials are copyrighted by the American Association for Respiratory Care. Any public display, sale, copy, or distribution of the video or materials may only be undertaken with the prior written consent of the AARC. As a registered participant, you are authorized to duplicate course materials for this program for each participant viewing at your facility. This presentation and accompanying materials can be used by staff within the institution, but cannot be resold, distributed, or displayed for profit. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved. The following is a presentation of the American Association for Respiratory Care. Welcome to Current Topics in Respiratory Care. Today's topic is State-of-the-Art ECMO. What's new? Dr. Heidi J. Dalton is Director of Adult and Pediatric ECMO, Innova Fairfax Medical Center, Professor of Clinical Surgery, George Washington University, Professor of Pediatrics, Virginia Commonwealth University in Scottsdale, Arizona. Dr. Dalton discloses relationships with McKay Instrumentation Labs, innovative ECMO concepts. My name is Heidi Dalton. I'm the director of the Adult and Pediatric uh, ECMO program in uh, Falls Church, uh, Virginia. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the state of the art of extracorporeal life support and what's new because certainly there is a lot going on in this particular uh, field. The uh, objectives of our uh, talk today are going to be to uh, enlighten you on the current uses of ECMO and associated outcomes that go along with it, the complications of both the veno-arterial approach and the veno-venous approach, and we're going to talk a little bit about the difference in physiology between the VA and the VV uh, ECMO uh, modalities. So I think as we all know, ECMO as a modality is really hot these days. Uh, certainly, if you look at uh, the ELSO registry, which remains the uh, largest uh, registry of extracorporeal life support recipients in the world, you can see that uh, neonates, even though they no longer are the largest part of the population, we still are treating about 800 neonates per year with ECMO. Uh, in the pediatric realm, at least for respiratory failure, uh, we're treating about four to 500 patients. And certainly the largest growth has come in the adult population with over a thousand percent increase uh, in the last 10 years of the use of ECMO uh, in, this in this particular population. We're doing a lot of patients that 10 years ago we wouldn't have done either. Uh, we never used to do bridge to transplant patients and now we're able to bridge patients to heart transplants, lung transplants, et cetera. Uh, we're doing many more complex patients with underlying comorbidities. And we have new technology which may or may not uh, make ECMO safer, but certainly applying ECMO in the veno-venous mode where you both drain blood uh, from the body on the venous side of the circulation and then reinfuse the oxygenated blood back into the venous side of the circulation as well is now really being pushed as potentially safer and more uh, efficient, especially for people who have just respiratory failure. And as you can see in the pie chart there, uh, over 81% now of uh, patients who are in the adult respiratory category are receiving venovenous uh, ECMO support as their primary mode. Now, as I mentioned, the ELSO registry remains the largest uh, repository of information on these patients. And you can see that we're now over 100,000 patients in this registry. Uh, and you can see it's broken down into neonates who are less than 31 days of age, pediatric patients up to the age of 18, and then adult patients over the age of 18. And you can see that the primary reason for uh, using ECMO, either for respiratory uh, dysfunction, cardiac dysfunction, or this relatively new category of eCPR, which is ECMO, which is applied during active cardiopulmonary arrest, which is refractory to conventional uh, means of resuscitation. And you can see that overall, we have about 60% uh, uh, survival 
uh, between all of those groups. Certainly neonates with pulmonary disease do the best because oftentimes that's pulmonary hypertension that just takes a few days to get better. But certainly uh, we are able to save even patients in active cardiac arrest about 30% uh, of the time. If you look at the categories of patients who have received ECMO historically, you can see from this graph that back in the early days, neonates were really where the action was, and almost all of ECMO was applied in the neonatal population. But as neonates uh, had success and uh, experience with ECMO became greater, it was then applied to more and more different populations until, as I mentioned, adult cardiac and adult respiratory patients are now the largest growing proportion of patients who are receiving ECMO on a yearly basis. And that is uh, depicted a little bit more here in this graph, in which if you look at adult cardiac runs over time, you can see that patients who have uh, congenital heart disease and who patients who have uh, cardiogenic shock represent probably the largest groups of patients in the adult world who are receiving uh, ECMO. But ECMO is also used for patients with cardiomyopathies, for myocarditis, and for other things such as toxic ingestions and associated cardiac uh, dysfunction. As I mentioned, uh, ECMO is also being used for resuscitation uh, from arrest, and if you want to go to YouTube and look at a cool video, you can see ECMO being applied actually to a patient in the Louvre uh, in Paris. Uh, it's also being uh, applied on the street. Uh, Paris actually has a study going on now where they actually take a little ECMO uh, mobile unit to the patient and implement ECMO there before they get them back. Uh, to the hospital, and it's also being done in emergency rooms uh, around the uh, world as well uh, for patients who come in in cardiac arrest. On sort of the flip side of that, we also see that ECMO is now being used for organ donation and preservation. Uh, and certainly there are articles out there now showing that uh, this is able to support patients' organs for a prolonged period of time and lessen the ischemic time that these organs have before they're harvested. And this has been shown to be very effective in kidney transplants, liver transplants, and that sort of thing. There is some uh, ethical concern with this. I mean, if you're doing eCPR on one hand, uh, when does resuscitation from ECMO stop and when does organ preservation begin? Uh, a lot of those issues I think we have not well delineated yet. But be aware that this is commonly uh, occurring in some centers around the world and likely will be uh, an increasingly large use of ECMO, especially as you know, the waiting list for uh, donors is uh, very, very uh, long in terms of getting good organs. And if we can increase the organ pool, uh, this may uh, have benefit for the patients that are on the waiting lists. Now, as I mentioned, the ELSO registry remains the largest repository of data, and there are now over 230 centers internationally uh, that report data to ELSO. And even though ELSO was sort of begun uh, as a North American type of uh, group uh, many years ago now, since uh, uh, 1989, you can see now that we have different chapters around the world. There's a Euro-ELSO chapter, there's an Asia-Pacific chapter, there's a Latin American chapter and uh, the North American conglomerate ELSO is sort of like the uh, big brother of all of those particular things. But one of the things uh, that is very concerning, and this is something I see as I travel around the world, that there are many, many, many centers who perform ECMO who don't report their data to ELSO and they don't report their data to any other group as well. And this is a big concern for those of us that are in this field because it gives us then a potentially inaccurate picture of how ECMO is being done, what outcomes are being uh, established, and uh, where we can help define best practice or worst practice or whatever. So if you're doing ECMO in your center, be sure that you ask, do you report data to ELSO because you should. It's also important that we look at uh, the global use of ECMO. And this is uh, just a chart showing the number of patients that are done throughout the world in the centers uh, that report uh, to ELSO. And you can see, actually, uh, most centers are doing a relatively small number of patients per year. So that ECMO is really 
uh, not something you do in hundreds and hundreds of patients, except in a few centers. Uh, but really, a lot of centers are supporting less than 10 patients per year. And I've highlighted for you there just the pink block, which is China. And I recently was in China speaking and was talking to my friend there, and he had done a survey of uh, China as a country and had found that there were over 157 centers who had supported something like uh, over 3,000 ECMO patients, and none of those centers report data to the ELSO uh, registry. Again, highlighting the fact that we need to capture all these patients to get a global indication of what's really happening. Now, for those of you who have been around for a while, and even uh, my gray hair is uh, probably not as old as these pictures, actually. But you can see uh, that ECMO has really changed over time. You know, the cat on the uh, picture there, that's the first heart-lung machine that was developed by John Gibbon back in the 1950s. And then uh, we've well, probably all seen this picture down below here. This is the first patient that was ever supported with ECMO, a motor vehicle accident patient. And that great big thing with the arrow is the oxygenator, took over five liters of blood to uh, prime it, uh, had a direct blood to gas interface, so it was very bad for your blood cells. You could only use it for a short period of time. And then in the upper right there, you see uh, a circuit with the silicone membrane lung. Uh, which certainly when I got started was the only uh, oxygenator available uh, and that was something that we all used for many, many years. It was very efficient. Uh, but now we know that we have all sorts of new devices. And with the advent uh, of new types of centrifugal technology, which is much kinder to blood cells, uh, and low resistance oxygenators, as you see depicted there uh, with the uh, hexagon type of um, oxygenator, that low resistance membrane really makes it so much easier to do ECMO and we've come up now with all these little miniaturized systems uh, which are like probably a tenth of the size of what we used when uh, I first got started. There's another oxygenator out there that's made by Meadows, um, also a hollow fiber oxygenator uh, that is uh, efficient and can be available here in the States uh, as well. And this is what a current system might look like. So very easy to move around, not a big trauma to move patients from one place to another. Uh, some circuits have lots of whistles and bells in terms of pressure monitoring and oxygenation monitoring and other things. Other people prefer to use really stripped down uh, models which really have very few safety features, uh, but at least they pump the blood and they pump the oxygen in the same way. And we also know that there are other types of devices that are on the market or coming soon to a place near you. And these are devices that are predominantly aimed at removing carbon dioxide. Uh, and this is especially important for COPD patients. As you know, many patients have COPD and certainly you know, suffocation almost from uh, inability to exchange CO2 is one of the ways these patients die or need a uh, lung transplant. And these devices require very little blood flow, usually less than a liter, but they're very efficient at removing uh, carbon dioxide in these patients. We also have new cannulas, uh, and these cannulas actually make it easier to do ECMO. Uh, the ones that you probably hear about the most is the Avalon, uh, which is depicted there. This is a single cannula, which is placed through your internal jugular vein and drains blood both from your SVC and your IVC. And then this oxygenated return is directed, if it's placed properly, right through your tricuspid valve, goes right into your right ventricle, and you get very little recirculation, that is very little sucking out of this oxygenated blood by the drainage ports. And it works very well when it's placed correctly, and I will say it is a pain to get it placed correctly. There is another cannula depicted there on the right called the Crescent, uh, made by Medtronic. Uh, which has just come out, which follows sort of the same principle, may have some uh, advantages. But certainly one of the things about these cannulas are that they are quite expensive uh, when it compared to sort of the single lumen cannulas that you see depicted down there below. If they save you surgical sites, if they save you bleeding complications, if you can get patients up and walking, perhaps they're worth it. And certainly uh, the center I work at, we use the Avalon and the Crescent quite readily. Uh, but whether or not they're really cost efficient yet has really yet to be uh, shown. And this is just the Crescent, just to kind of show you that, again, uh, it has little uh, markers on it so that you can actually tell where the ports are if you take an x-ray. You can also see 
that it has a larger infusion port, so that is the, the blood coming back from the ECMO circuit, uh, has a little bit less resistance maybe than some of the other models, not quite sure about that. Uh, and then it also has specific places where you can suture it to the vessel and suture it to the skin without uh, risking damaging uh, the cannula. Remember that uh, if you're using one of these cannulas, I really believe they should be placed under fluoroscopy uh, because there are multiple anecdotal and some in the literature uh, scenarios where people have not noticed that the wire that you place them over has been coiled in the right atrium or whatever, and then you go to stick in the cannula and it ends up someplace where you don't want perforating something that you don't want to perforate. So people use TEE, they use ECHO, but truthfully, fluoro is the best way to do these things, to get them in the right uh, position. If you're using a single lumen cannula, certainly you can put them in like any uh, normal uh, central line. So we also know that ECMO can be done now actually without a pump. Uh, in patients with uh, very bad pulmonary hypertension, like this baby shown here, you can actually place a cannula either in the right atrium and drain blood from the right atrium and then put the return cannula in the pulmonary artery and let the uh, patient's own right heart drive the blood uh, back uh, across the uh, pulmonary circuit and back uh, into the left heart. Or if the patient uh, won't tolerate that, you can actually drain blood from the right side of the heart and then let the right ventricle push the blood uh, across the pulmonary circuit and then they give the reinfusion port into the left side uh, of the circulation. And this has been done actually in several uh, studies which are now uh, in publication so that patients who are on a waiting list for heart-lung transplants, for instance, or patients who have very bad pulmonary hypertensive crises uh, can receive this type of support. And the benefit is, without all the other aspects of the ECMO circuit, you don't have to use as much heparin for anticoagulation, and it may make the patient at less risk uh, for bleeding. Likewise, in uh, adults, you can use blood pressure provided by their systemic circulation to drive blood across a low uh, resistance oxygenator as shown here. And with that, actually, you can remove almost all the CO2 the patient makes and get a little bit of oxygenation uh, assistance as well. And then that oxygenated blood, which has had CO2 removed from it, is just uh, driven by the patient's own systemic pressure across the oxygenator and back into the venous side. Uh, of the circulation. Another thing that you may hear about uh, is the Tandem Heart. It's still called the Tandem Heart, although the company was uh, recently purchased by Levanova, the same people that own Soren now. But uh, this is an example of something called the Protec Duo. Uh, this is designed as a right ventricular assist device. Uh, but it does have an oxygenator that you can also use, or some people cut out the oxygenator and put in a different one. But uh, the idea with this is that you can drain from the patient's uh, right atrium, and then you place this cannula uh, similar to a pulmonary artery cannula so that the return port is in the pulmonary artery, and then you return this oxygenated blood or you return the uh, blood coming back from the pump right into the pulmonary uh, circuit. Um, it's interesting that this, this kit cost about $19,000. Uh, but some people uh, love the cannula so much that they throw away the rest of it and just use the cannula, which seems like a waste of money to me. But um, just be aware that this is out there too. The, I don't, I've never used this myself. I have heard some concerns about the oxygenator, uh, but there are studies out there that are um, uh, looking at this particular device as a way to uh, manage patients, especially those patients who have uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, and who have uh, some problems with right ventricular failure as well. Now, who's getting ECMO? Well, this is a uh, recent article looking at uh, 17,000 patients, and you can see the large increase uh, in uh, patient populations, 361% increase uh, over this um, eight-year period or so. Uh, you can see that in respiratory patients, post-cardiotomy patients, lung transplant patients, cardiogenic shock patients, heart transplant, all of them, uh, the use of ECMO in both of all of these scenarios is increasing. And interestingly, uh, even though a lot of these patients represent more complex patients than have ever been done before, over this period of time, mortality actually decreased from 62% to 43%, but that was predominantly driven by a decrease in post-cardiotomy mortality and the fact that there are now some other devices which are being used in post-cardiotomy 
uh, patients over time. If you look at where you get ECMO, there is a difference. Uh, as shown in this uh, particular graph here, you can see that the largest increase in the use of ECMO is in the Northeast, a relatively small part of the country. Uh, the Midwest and the, and the uh, West kind of stay sort of stable, a little bit of an increase, and a little bit of an increase in the South. Uh, as well. And you remember that in the West, even though on the map there it takes up half of the country, uh, the use of ECMO or the availability to receive ECMO is much less in some other denser places uh, in the country, such as uh, the Northeast. The other thing that you want to notice uh, from these particular graphs is that there has also been an increase in the use of ECMO in small and medium-sized hospitals as compared uh, to uh, larger hospitals. And then if you uh, look at the number of hospitalizations and, and costs and volumes and all that stuff, you can see that on the other side of the graph there. But be aware of the fact that some of these small centers are using ECMO, may be good because it means that ECMO is more available. It may be bad because a lot of centers are just buying a pump and putting people on ECMO with very little training and with very little um, expertise in their particular institution. And if you look at uh, outcome in these patients, you can see, as I mentioned, that overall mortality is about 53%. Cardiogenic shock patients have the worst uh, outcomes. And again, a lot of these patients come in either after an arrest or during a, an active MI. They may have failed other devices such as impellas or uh, balloon pumps or whatever. Lung transplants, actually, even though they represent a relatively small portion of those patients receiving ECMO, seem to do okay, both in the pre-lung transplant and the post-lung transplant. Heart transplants, you can see respiratory failure patients, about 50% survival. And again, one thing to notice, though, is even though these rates are potentially you know, better than death, all groups, except for the postcardiotomy patients, have had increased death rates over time, again indicating, I think, that we're doing more complex patients with a lot of comorbidities. And there is also evidence, uh, looking at some of the labs that were collected in this study, uh, that these patients had increased severity of illness over time, another reason, potentially, where the death rate is uh, going up instead of down. It's also evident from this study that large hospitals had higher mortality. The highest mortality was in the Midwest, uh, which is you know, like sad for me. I grew up in Michigan. I'm a Michigan State fan. Uh, but even after adjusting for age and severity, mortality was highest in the Midwest. And I think part of this may be if you look at centers, certainly the center where a lot of ECMO has originated and that sort of thing is in Michigan. Um, a lot of centers in the Midwest are the ones that support more patients or who have the most experience and get more patients transferred to them. And there was really not any information in this particular study on the effect of transfers from small and medium sites, but it's pretty simple to see that if you have a small and medium center who has somebody that's really sick, they're going to potentially transfer them to a larger hospital for things that they can't do there, such as give them a transplant or maybe put them on a VAD or do a lung transplant or something like that. So the take-home points from this uh, study are that ECMO is really increasing rapidly in groups uh, outside postcardiotomy. It is associated still with a high death rate. There is a difference in utilization, and certainly the access to ECMO is not uniform across the nation. And I think that this, this may reflect uh, some center expertise, some center reputation, and whether or not in your particular center you have an ECMO believer or not uh, and are willing to use this modality. And it's interesting that in this particular publication, which isn't that old now, cost and length of stay over time have remained relatively uh, stable. And we'll come back to talk about that later. I wanted to go back for just a minute and talk about ELSO one more time to just say that one of the other things that the ELSO group has done this year, actually just started this summer, was to develop a way that you can evaluate your program against like centers across the nation. And so the uh, Arbometrics Quality Platform is something where you can go and you can look at your mortality compared to other centers, whether you're a small, medium, large center, where you are in the country, that sort of thing. 
and you can get these nice run charts. Uh, you can also do this for complication rates, uh, so you can see where you're doing better than somebody else or worse than somebody else. And I think by defining these uh, parameters a little bit more and getting more data uh, refined in this particular platform, we're finally going to be able to develop some ideas of best practice uh, and where we can go to make ECMO more efficient. Again, ECMO is relatively uh, cheap in terms of joining ELSO, so if you're not a center member, uh, you know, you should be. Uh, if you're outside the United States, uh, the membership levels are adjusted based on your, um, your gross national product or whatever, uh, so that uh, in areas where countries are poorer than the United States, the cost of joining ELSO is less as well. ELSO also offers the ability to become a center of excellence. Uh, this is a good way to evaluate your program because, believe it or not, the application is really pretty stringent. You have to go through a lot of paperwork, and it's a very rigorous application, and it now has gold, silver, and platinum levels. And the reason this is also important for your center is it is recognized by U.S. News and World Reports, you know, which we all uh, think is such a big deal in terms of uh, evaluating our hospitals. Uh, and you do get points for being an ELSO Center of Excellence. So I encourage you to uh, look into that if your center isn't already uh, one of these sites. Now, let's talk about cardiac ECMO for just a minute. What do experts recommend? And so this is an article from uh, just not very long ago in which these experts, uh, mainly from the UK and around Europe, sat down and said, okay, let's go through all these cardiogenic shock patients and figure out what is best for them. And certainly, uh, peripheral ECMO is something that certainly was recommended by this particular group. And if you look uh, at other things that they recommended, mobile units to set up venoarterial ECMO in the field is recommended, and there was strong agreement for that. So just be aware, you know, this may be coming to uh, a neighborhood near you soon. Don't have too many of these uh, in the states yet, although there are several groups that will provide transport of ECMO patients uh, around the country from one site to another or go to a site and put patients on ECMO. It's also true that ECMO can be very efficient for patients with cardiac toxicity, especially from things like calcium channel blockers and that sort of thing. Uh, and you can support patients while their heart is recovering. And I think this is something sometimes that we forget about. And so if you have a patient who has had an overdose of one of these drugs, remember that actually ECMO can be helpful uh, in this particular scenario. The other thing that is happening uh, in a lot of centers now is that ECMO is being applied to patients with septic shock or vasoplegic shock. And while this is recommended, just remember that if you have really bad vasoplegia and you cannot uh, tighten up uh, your systemic vascular resistance enough, even providing support with ECMO may not be uh, enough. And certainly cardiogenic shock is something uh, that uh, you can uh, use ECMO for. It's very important, however, uh, when you're doing these things to have an end game that's in place so that you know what you're gonna do with the patient if they don't recover. Patients with um, myocarditis are also patients that do quite well with ECMO. Uh, this is one group actually where uh, success can be had without need for a VAD or a transplant. Even after weeks on ECMO, they can recover. Uh, most folks for cardiogenic shock patients will say, well, if we haven't done any, gotten anywhere in a couple of weeks, we should transition them to a longer term device or list them for a heart transplant uh, or whatever. But certainly you really want to avoid this sort of bridge to nowhere. So as soon as you put somebody on ECMO, start thinking about this is how you're going to get them off or this is where their next uh, device is going to come into play because there's nothing worse than having an awake and conversive patient and knowing they're not a candidate for a transplant, they're not a candidate for a VAD or other device, and they're not going to survive and having to uh, deal with that both with them and with their family. Now, ECMO is not without complications, absolutely. So this is one study just looking at adult patients with cardiac uh, shock and arrest. And you can see here that the uh, patients had uh, you know, neurologic problems in terms of strokes, required a lot of renal dialysis, bleeding, and thrombosis are uh, very big complications related to ECMO. And these patients were put on ECMO through the groin. And even though a lot of them had distal perfusion cannulas, uh, in their arterial cannula site to try and perfuse the distal limb. Many of them required 
uh, fasciotomy. Some patients even still required amputations. So when you do this, remember that there are complications that are associated, and certainly uh, a lot of us in the field, this is my particular area of research interest, is uh, decreasing bleeding and thrombotic uh, complications. So just recapping then, uh, cardiac ECMO is helpful for many circumstances. Unloading the left heart may be helpful. Uh, you need to use it before you have multi-organ failure. Uh, you can use it to bridge to other devices. And again, you want to have a plan to identify when to use it, who to use it in, uh, and how that should be uh, put together. And in our particular center, we found that we were missing a lot of shock patients, that we were getting to them late, and so we developed a cardiogenic shock team for earlier identification of patients with bad shock. And I won't go over all this data for you here, but just to show that our ability then to intervene became uh, much more efficient. We got patients to devices much quicker, and our outcomes actually have been uh, much improved over the last year or two while we've had this uh, process in place. Okay, let's switch to respiratory failure for just a minute here. So I think everybody is aware of this article by uh, Amato looking at the influence of driving pressure on outcome in respiratory failure patients. And certainly, you wanna have a driving pressure of less than 15 versus higher than 15. Uh, and this has also been shown in ECMO patients as well. So this was looking at patients uh, who had ARDS who were placed on ECMO, and they also found that the driving pressure on the first day of ECMO uh, was associated with in-hospital mortality. Uh, even though the effects of PEEP, PIP, plateau pressure, respiratory rate actually were not significant in this particular article because certainly PEEP has been something that folks have talked about uh, a lot as well. And as many, many other articles have shown, if you maintain on ECMO with a high lactate and you're acidotic and you don't get better, that's a bad sign and you need to either uh, add in more support or decide that the patient's not going to survive. The other thing that this study found was that the FiO2 on day one also was associated with higher mortality so that if you were unable or you didn't, uh, decrease your FiO2 on the ventilator, that that was also associated with uh, poor outcome. How do we treat patients on ECMO? This is a retrospective study also done by Matteo Schmidt. Uh, and you can see here that if you looked at patients who were alive and dead, you can see their, their tidal volumes, their plateau pressures, their driving pressures, again, uh, and their compliance uh, in this particular univariate analysis. Uh, were associated with outcomes, although driving pressure fell out as the only major factor on multivariate uh, analysis. Another thing that they found uh, in this particular study was that PEEP actually was associated with a better outcome. And so in the first three days of ECMO, patients who had a higher PEEP, that is, you know, 14 versus 12, uh, had a uh, increase in survivorship as opposed to patients who were maintained on lower levels uh, of PEEP in the first few days. And none of this has really been confirmed, but certainly uh, this gives us some data that we need to collect uh, more in the future to see if these observations are really correct uh, or not. There was also a difference in terms of where you were. So this study looked predominantly at centers in France uh, versus Australia. You can see here that if you were in France, you, know, uh, you had better outcomes than in Australia. I'm sure the Australians don't want to hear that, uh, but that's true. Uh, you can see that the duration between ICU admission and ECMO initiation was also important. Again, uh, in this particular thing, if you had a high plateau pressure greater than 30, that was important as well. And again, we've already talked about PEEP and uh, lactate as being important predictors, at least in this study uh, as well. One of the other things that has happened in terms of ECMO is how long do you do it? So in the old days, we used to have a cutoff of two weeks because the complications from the circuits were so great that at two weeks you kind of stopped. Uh, this is one study from the folks at Maryland uh, in which they evaluated patients who were on ECMO for less than 10 days, 10 to 20 days, and greater than 20 days. And as you can see here, there was really uh, no difference. And actually, the group that did the worst were the patients in the mid-range there. Uh, the 10 to 20 day patients, uh, so that even patients who are on ECMO for 20 days now uh, had uh, quite good survival at uh, 52%. So if ECMO is safer, applied to more patient groups, it's reasonable survival, what's the major catch? And certainly this remains it. Bleeding and thrombosis complications are still high, 
and they're the ones that are associated with increased morbidity and mortality. And there is no perfect system and no perfect regimen of anticoagulation uh, that has been identified to reduce these complications and make ECMO so much safer. It's still a very high resource use modality, and one of the things that we're all going to have to worry about now is can we afford it. So I'm just going to share a couple slides with you. This is an article that came out very recently uh, in which they looked at an average ECMO patient, young, being 45 years old, uh, who was on lung protect, and they compared that to a patient who was on lung protective ventilation with a positive inspiratory pressure of less than 30 and a tidal volume of 6. And what you can see here is that the incremental difference between those two modalities, ECMO was more important. But if you looked at quality adjusted life years, ECMO did better uh, than the lung protective ventilation model patients. And when you looked at the amount of uh, expense that was related to ECMO, you can see actually that the cost effectiveness in these patients uh, went up quite a bit in terms of the ECMO group, while not so much in the mechanical ventilation group. And so the conclusion from this particular study, and this was a pretty well done uh, model, uh, was that ECMO actually in uh, young adult patients with ARDS was cost effective, and you know you should try to confirm these, this data, but um, we, you know, they end by saying here, we believe it should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis in patients who have a high likelihood of long-term functional outcome, and certainly that's one of the things uh, that we really have uh, very little data on how to pick those patients. And they also mention it should be limited to expert high-volume centers, which is something uh, that may come up in the future. There is some data to show that high-volume centers do better than low-volume centers and how that will relate to regionalization of this technology, I really don't know. But finally, what about money? So the one thing I did want to uh, tell you about that you maybe have not heard about is the fact that uh, in October of 2018, CMS came up with new recommendations on how to reimburse peripheral ECMO. And what they did was they said, well, we're going to reimburse it at a rate similar to three, uh, 96 hours of mechanical ventilation. And again, CMS, remember, only applies to patients over 65 years. but Oftentimes, CMS says one thing and all the other third-party payers start uh, doing the same thing. And so uh, what, was, what is noticed with this is that if you use peripheral VA and VV ECMO, which is where the majority of ECMO is done these days, uh, until October 1st of 2018, you used to have a base rate uh, for DRGs of about $100,000. Now they're dropping that to $7,000. And if that holds true, it's going to mean uh, a lot of differences for the application of ECMO. Because in most centers, ECMO programs actually are um, cost effective and they do actually uh, make enough money for the hospital that they can continue the program. It's interesting that if you add an impella or a peripheral ventricular assist device with ECMO, that the reimbursement then rate goes up quite a bit, as you can see there, into the 70,000s. But truthfully, if you're on VV ECMO, the need for an impella would be almost non-existent because you can't do VV ECMO without a well-functioning heart. So this is being talked with the CMS people by a lot of different groups, also the STS, ATS, uh, because uh, a lot of the groups that use ECMO were not involved in this decision and are quite dismayed by the fact that this got through without any of the experts in the field being aware of it. So more to come on that particular thing. So with all those things, why should you bother doing this? Well, this is just sort of why. You know, this little baby here is Esperanza, the first neonate ever described on ECMO. And that's her there at the bottom there with Bob Bartlett, the father of ECMO. Uh, and she is now, you know, she has three kids of her own now that are grown. The girl on the right there is a girl that was also treated as a neonate, getting her white coat uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, a successful neonatal survivor as well. And certainly some of the patients that I've treated also, very uh, interesting and excellent stories of why you go to the mat for these types of patients. Uh, and again, some of the complicated patients that we're treating now, trauma, MVAs, abdominal degloving injuries, aortic dissection, that guy is now home. There he is right there when he came back to see us in the hospital. And, and here is uh, on the right is a 49-year-old guy, had an MI, was on ECMO, had some complications. He's now uh, back to work and actually just hosted his first run uh, for ECMO patients uh, back in Virginia.
and certainly as a bridge to heart transplant pre and post. This girl was bridged pre and post ECMO uh, cystic fibrosis patient. And remember that these patients are a lot of work. For those of you who may be involved in ECMO in your centers, uh, in my particular center, we're gonna do about 20,000 hours of ECMO support this year. And certainly this is a team approach that we can't do it without the ECMO specialist, the respiratory therapist, the nurses, the doctors, everybody that's involved in curing these patients. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens with the CMS regulations. Hopefully by the time you see this, this will be a done deal and we won't have to worry about it. But some of us are actually asking families to write CMS in support of continuing ECMO because of these financial changes hold true. Uh, I think this modality will have a very hard time uh, being done in centers, except that are very large uh, can have, uh, and can have a lot of uh, patients. So it's hard to give a, a talk these days uh, about ECMO without referring to the IOLA trial, which was uh, published in the New England Journal in May of 2018. And this trial was designed uh, to sort of uh, combat a lot of the criticisms of the CSER trial, which was published a few years ago from the UK, in which uh, ECMO was compared to patients uh, who were also treated with conventional mechanical ventilation. And those patients who received ECMO or who were transferred to the ECMO site, and only one site was used, uh, had much better outcomes than patients that were treated with conventional mechanical ventilation in other outlying sites. But that uh, study was criticized a lot because there was not a controlled uh, mechanical ventilation arm necessarily. People were allowed to do whatever they thought was best in their own institution. So Iolia was developed uh, to also do a comparison between conventional mechanical ventilation and ECMO, uh, with the primary endpoint being mortality at 60 days in both of those uh, groups. And as I mentioned, was recently published uh, in the New England Journal. So the primary endpoint of this study was death at 60 days. And you can see here the relative risk uh, for the ECMO population was 35% uh, versus 46% in the control group, which was not statistically significant, close but not a winner. Uh, and that was also true for the hazard ratio uh, as well. Certainly one of the criticisms from this study actually though is that if the data and uh, safety monitoring board had let them go a little bit longer, like maybe an extra 20 patients, uh, that potentially this would have been a statistically uh, significant trial in favor of uh, ECMO, but you know, it is what it is. In terms of secondary endpoints, this was a secondary endpoint in which they looked at death or the need for ECMO in the uh, control group. And here you can see that when you added this into the equation, uh, that ECMO actually had much better uh, outcomes. The death rate was 35% versus 57% uh, in the control group, and that also included patients who were crossed over uh, to ECMO uh, as well. And when you looked at other secondary outcomes uh, from this particular study, such as the, how many uh, days the patients were free of vasopressor use or cardiac failure, dialysis, renal failure, how many days they had to receive prone positioning or nitric oxide or prostacyclin, you can see that uh, the ECMO group uh, had more favorable outcomes in all of those secondary outcomes uh, as well. And again, just to mention the crossover to ECMO patients, because this is an important part of this study, almost 30% of the patients who were in the control arm received rescue ECMO for refractory hypoxemia, and they were entered in at a much later date in their uh, course than the ECMO patients. The ECMO patients received ECMO within like the first day and a half of their hospitalization. These guys had uh, been in the hospital for almost a week. Uh, six patients actually were placed on ECMO in arrest uh, and had to receive venoarterial support. And you can see, if you just look at the uh, severity of their ARDS at baseline, you can see that they were requiring higher plateau pressures, higher driving pressures. They had lower system uh, compliance of the respiratory tract, and they had uh, worse infiltrates uh, on their chest X-ray as compared to those patients uh, who went on ECMO earlier and were randomized to the uh, ECMO uh, group. And again, if you look at patients uh, who uh, did not have uh, crossover, you can see their uh, mortality rate there. Uh, but again, if you looked at the crossover patients, they certainly had the highest death rate with uh, over 50% of them uh, uh, dying, even with uh, ECMO uh, support. This is interesting because the editors of the New England Journal actually wrote the editorial that went along uh, with this particular study. 
uh, and their particular opinion was that the fact that uh, if you looked at the control group and you looked at the secondary outcomes and you looked at um, how sick the control patients were and that got crossed over to ECMO, that if you had um, defined those patients uh, the way to analyze them a little bit differently, that ECMO probably has some benefit uh, in the setting of uh, respiratory failure, despite the trial not being traditionally positive. And as I mentioned, the secondary outcomes also favored uh, the ECMO group. So if you're an ECMO believer, you think this shows that ECMO is worthwhile. Uh, if you're not an ECMO believer, then you know it shows that uh, another study that didn't have statistical significance. Uh, Luciano Gattinoni, who's well known to many of us as a you know godfather in uh, critical care and respiratory failure, his opinion is well at least it showed that ECMO doesn't kill people because the survival certainly was not higher in the ECMO group. And this is a editorial written by Bob Bartlett, uh, just saying that what we should really focus on now is how to figure out how to give ECMO earlier to those patients who are at really high risk of death, those patients in the uh, 57 percent uh, death rate aim, range, and figure out when to intervene earlier. The other thing that is very important now is that patients can now be uh, bridged with ECMO for months. And actually, many of you may have heard of the 605-day ECMO uh, duration course from Hopkins. It was done a few years ago. So that many patients now are going on ECMO after months of uh, support, and we're finding that lo and behold, their lung can remodel, which is something that we never thought was true except in the pediatric population. And one of the ways that uh, is recommended is if we're going to have people on these systems for months, we're going to have to get them out of the hospital to decrease the cost with it. And certainly wearable artificial lungs are really uh, not that far away, certainly in the adult population. Um, I happen to be an advisor to Bart Griffith's uh, group at the University of Maryland who just got an uh, NIH grant to develop a pediatric artificial lung. So you're going to see those things uh, coming down the pike, I think, relatively soon. And this is a depiction of what it may look like, you know, very integrated uh, pump and oxygenator that you can just wear and walk around and uh, save yourself from getting a lung transplant, but maintain uh, good oxygenation. Uh, as well. And this is true uh, not only in the um, futuristic world, but this is our friends from Sweden. Uh, they, you know, they, they taught us a lot. And this is a patient on ECMO who wanted to go home for tea. Uh, and so they packed her up and took her home uh, about 100 kilometers from where she was at, uh, at the Karolinska in Sweden. And she had tea and uh, stuff with her family. And then they took her back to the hospital later on that night. So not something you see too much around here in the States, but it may be coming uh, and certainly is being done safely in other parts of the world as well. There's also been a change in philosophy of uh, how we do ECMO with some of the new equipment and such so that it's now recommended keep people awake, you know, keep, keep people awake, spontaneously breathing, moving. Uh, it's good for rehab so they don't lose their muscle strength. And all of these types of uh, scenarios have been uh, well established now as being effective. And yes, they can be done uh, if we stop our liberal use of sedation. Other things that I think are very important are all of these cartridge type uh, d events that are coming down the pike. Uh, this is, uh, these photos are shared with me from Tim Mall from uh, Florida. But we all have now these cartridges that you're going to see coming on the market pretty soon that make ECMO very simple to do. Uh, and the smart cannula is a cannula you stick it in and it sort of expands to the uh, vessel size, something else that may be very useful, especially in emergent situations. And look for these things uh, coming uh, to a center near you as well. And then this idea, which I think is uh, something else that we're going to see, is this is a physio-controlled pump so that there's really uh, no person needed. You know, the sweep gas to control the CO2 is adjusted by the blood gases that are monitored within the system. The oxygenation is adjusted. The pump flow is adjusted based on blood pressure and that sort of thing. And truthfully, this is really not pie in the sky. If you think about it, you know, we already uh, have um, physiologic feedback that control other things like insulin pumps or AICDs. So this type of uh, completely physio-controlled uh, uh, respiratory care and ECMO is something that I think you may see in our lifetime.
uh, as well. And finally, in the neonatal population, certainly the artificial placenta is something that has been coming for a lot of years now. Uh, and is almost ready for prime time. Uh, this is work from Alan Flake at CHOP in Philadelphia. Also folks in Michigan are working on this concept as well. And I don't have all the slides in here, but certainly they have very nice videos now of this little lamb uh, making it to uh, maturity and running around uh, their laboratory as a healthy little lamb. So some of the stuff you may also see uh, that's coming out. And here's the lamb uh, as he's growing with this artificial type of placenta and getting blood flow just through his umbilical vessels. So pretty cool stuff that you're probably going to see uh, as you uh, move forward in the workforce as well. So in closing, the future of ECMO is really to continue to assess the quality of life and the cost benefit of it. Um, really adequate reimbursement, I hate to say this, but it may really hamper further technology advancement. Uh, it may cause us to reverse the older technology, which is cheaper, but may not, may not be as efficient. It may limit access to ECMO. Uh, and, you know, uh, it may revert us to the days where, you know, can you do this for a year at a time or whatever. And certainly in other countries, I hate to say this too, but in other countries, modalities like ECMO are pay for service. They go to the family and say, this is how much it's going to cost. Can you pay for it? Do you want it or not? Hope we never get there, but certainly all of us need to continue to refine this process to pick the patients that are going to do well uh, so that they can become uh, you know, functional members of society and have a good quality of life. And I think this is something that we all need to work for uh, as we continue to look at ECMO and related modalities to support our patients with respiratory and or cardiac failure. The use of ECMO is increasing exponentially in every age group, especially in the adult realm. There are new devices coming down the pike which are going to be aimed predominantly at CO2 removal, which respiratory therapy is going to have a major role in, I believe. Uh, and also, uh, the, how we treat the lung, both before and during ECMO, is controversial, not really known. Uh, but certainly a debatable topic for which there is no exact science and we need help in defining how to make the uh, ventilator support during ECMO uh, safer to protect the lung. Thanks very much for your attention.